Yeah, um, Yanina, I think, will be our moderator now. Yanina, very happy to see you. I'm passing you the reins now. Yanina is a PhD student of the uh, PhD school at the uh, School of Art and Design. She's a researcher of music, and today she will moderate this session, which is about to begin in three minutes, Art and Design, Expanding the Boundaries. So this will be a very expanding se session, hopefully. Now I'm trying to understand whether our English language speaker joined us because I can't see him for now. But anyway, we'll say a couple of words about the uh, the availability of uh, simultaneous interpretation. We uh, will have simultaneous interpretation until 1.20. So we'll have it for this session now devoted to art and urbanism in the broadest sense of this term. The talks will be very diverse, and very interesting. So this is it. Uh, who are not Russian speakers and who would like to follow uh, this uh, panel, uh, you uh, can follow it in English. Uh, the translation is available. You choose uh, when you can see the globe icon on the lower panel on the right, and you choose English channel to translate uh, or to, to follow it in English. So, and here I'm, I'm living, uh, not living, just, Yanina, the floor is totally yours. So. Mm -hmm. Good morning, dear colleagues. Uh, Ludmila introduced me already, so I think I will switch to the boring uh, part. I will remind you about time limitations. Every one of you will have 15 minutes for a talk and we'll have five minutes for questions. Um, for you to keep track of the time, I will show you this sign two minutes before your time is up. So please uh, pay attention to the video with me on Zoom. When the 15 minutes are over, you will hear a timer signal from my phone. That will be a sign that you will need to wrap up. Uh, you're also welcome to use the chat. And I will follow the chat and you must just hear. OK, I won't bore you anymore. And I'm happy to invite our first participant, Anastasia Kazantseva, St. Petersburg Culture Institute. Her talk is called Social Cultural Identity and uh, part Participatory Design in a New um, me um, Megalopolis Neighborhoods. Yeah, most welcome, Anastasia. Thank you very much. My name is Anastasia, and I'm a PhD student um, at St. Petersburg Institute of Culture. And today, as you have already said, I'm going to talk about participatory design. It's part of my thesis and hopefully will be of use to you. Uh, sorry, I will need to share my screen. It will take just a second. Can you see my presentation? Okay, fine. Uh, then I shall begin. Every year, the urban population is growing. Uh, flow An inflow of people is uh, moving to cities to improve uh, their life quality. Many uh, big cities cannot cope with the growing number of residents. So this is why the suburban uh, areas have more and more neighborhoods coming up to host as many residents as possible. And other factors of comfort are unfortunately not taken into account. So the residents of the suburbia uh, live with very poor infrastructure and, and very often are even marginalized. But another uh, tendency is uh, boatification is taken into account too. And one of the projects is uh, creating comfortable urban environment, which is oriented as active engagement of the local residents in different 
fortification projects, we can see uh, these examples as uh, those that testify the necessity of engagement of audiences into socio-cultural life. Our way neighborhoods are kind of an ecosystem on one and the same territory. Mostly local residents interact. Uh, growing infrastructure and the absence of uh, neighborhood solidarity um, is a problem. Building social cultural identity from scratch is an actionable way of creating a cultural identity of a neighborhood, something which will make the neighborhood stand out on the background of other neighborhoods. We shall introduce the term urban identity in this discussion. Urban identity is a component of uh, the social identification, a social cultural construct uh, which helps a human being to identify himself or herself with a specific community. and. Um, it, is, it deals with the reproduction of the social capital of the city. This term has been poorly researched lately, but now we can see that neighborhoods become cities and towns in themselves. For example, on this slide, you can see March 2019, um, one of the rural areas turning into a neighborhood and acquired a status of a city. A city identity is also a territory identity, uh, which is as, as which, is, which helps people make sense of their belonging and of their identity. The symbolic uh, foundation is very important for uh, the sense of belonging to a territory. When you ask people what is uh, their home, the a majority will think about their apartment. So to uh, build a structural and infrastructural unit, it's not enough to think only about territories, we also need social cultural identities. The process of forming social cultural identification is accompanied uh, by you know, the active engagement of an individual into um, absorbing new norms, values, social roles, and uh, through, uh, through feeling like part of a culture which is uh, prevalent on a certain territory. People feel like they are part of a social group. Many uh, cities in Russia are evolving uh, in the strategy of coexisting communities. There is no uh, solidarized urban identity of a given city. Different neighborhoods where there is no solidarity, no sense of neighborhood, cultural planning could help. Cultural planning is one of the types of territory marketing. It is a concept of uh, local urban development. It includes different events at uh, territory evolution, territory development, standard solutions, standardized solutions are not enough for public spaces. Expertise of urban planners, of architects is always superficial because uh, they do not feel uh, the deep meanings, uh, the deep sense of a special territory. Similar creative spaces or cultural centers in different neighborhoods make them interesting for all residents of a city and it makes cultural development of a city go evenly you don't need to commute to the city center to um for some culture related leisure how to win in the competition for the most recognizable image of a neighborhood both for the locals and uh, for the outside communities Today, more and more experts turn to branding, territory branding. Today, there are a lot of branding practices, but all the practices have common traits, which define a brand as a complex of actions of an urban community, which aim at confirming their interests in social economic de development of a city. In other words, it is about promoting the interests of a city. The result of 
this uh, action should be supported by the local residents, business, all local communities. Uh, what the administration has to do is just coordinate and curate the actions. Only then the brand of the territory will be successful. Here example is an example of uh, of uh, successful territory development. Authors Ivan Svistinov and City Branding, the, the town of Dobranka in the Permsk area. Uh, this project answered the question, uh, what is our city about? At the beginning of 2012, uh, the mayor of Dobranka, Sergei Akulov, invited city branding to try to overcome the crisis. And in May, they already agreed upon the concept. And in June, uh, there was a presentation that Dobranka is the capital of the good. Dobranka has the same root as the good. Um, in a poll, the local residents were encouraged to describe their native city uh, with an adjective, and almost all of them spoke about goodness. And this uh, word capital in the brand is also important. If the brand was just a kind or a good city, that wouldn't sound the same. The problems of uh, city branding are diverse. One of them is is uh, the scattered nature of some of the projects. So, uh, for example, in Krasnodar, the only thing that uh, the expert did was a logo, and that was it, which is not enough. Another failure is when is when um, the brand is taken as a brand of the whole city or uh, when we need to talk about neighborhoods, or on the contrary, uh, when we take a brand of a, fac of a local factory and expand it to the whole city. Another thing is that a designer of a brand has to grow a community around him or her, which will help the city evolve later on. They will become brand ambassadors. These people have to be educated. We need to uh, consult them, of course. If we turn back uh, to the identities, unfortunately, they are not evolved enough. Here is a neighborhood called uh, the native lands, Rodney Prastori in Krasnodar. Uh, the only thing that is that was done here is a logo and um, and the merchandise. What could help here is public art. Uh, Postmodern art practices left the spaces into the real world in the 20th century, and artists started to relate to the space around them. Art in parks and in public spaces becomes accessible to all and becomes a very widespread practice and acquires new socio-cultural aspects. Public art, a phenomenon that was born in the United States of America in the 60s, uh, when a program, a national program was launched uh, to educate, to reach as many uh, residents of the country as possible with art. And it included also peripheral art, uh, peripheral territories where with no state support, no art would emerge there on its own. Public art is a form of the contemporary arts existence beyond uh, the art infrastructure in the public space addressed at audiences, including unprepared um, ones, and uh, which problematizes different questions of uh, contemporary art and the space it is presented in. The main mission of public art is looking for strategically meaningful development of the city. The goal of public art is uh, finding different facets of what we are used to. Ikonnikov, in his article, 
Art Environment Time writes that the urban environment is not just a sum of engineering uh, solutions. It's a whole which is not closed in itself, but is directly related to conditioned forms of human behavior. To confirm this thought, we can turn um, into practices. This is um, a typical panel uh, building built in the 70s. In Poland, there are thousands of such houses, but only this one turned into an artwork for a time. In February 2000, Pavel Althammer, the local resident, turned uh, the house number 13 into an art action, an art campaign. Uh, he uh, talked to local residents and at a given time they were asked to um, turn on the lights or to turn off the lights. And the facade featured this beautiful number of 2000. Uh, the artist engaged 200 families which normally do not communicate with each other and many of them are not interested in art. Pavel is famous because he introduces art to public spaces, he works with people and for people. He managed to convince uh, the neighbors to cooperate and the result was this large-scale campaign that 3,000 people took part in. Uh, art can take different forms, it can criticize, it can decorate, it can encourage action, but the main goal is to give the space an identity. A work of art enables one to feel part of a neighborhood, get to know one's neighbors and to do something together. Then we can see that a panel building could be a good place for life. Together with these um, cultural activism projects, we also need to mention the local grassroots initiatives. Every year, a different, um, different blocks take part in a competition of the most fortified area, uh, which includes paintings done by local residents or sculptures. Um, the local residents use the available materials, for example, flat tires, to create sculptures or to create some art pieces. Since tires uh, cannot be recycled, it is legal to use them as decorations. The local residents who created this art, we can see in the image were the authors of it. Similar initiatives can be part of the cultural identity um, and local residents need to be engaged. A key tool that one can use here is participatory planning. Participatory planning uh, is about engaging the local activists, uh, the local administration, a business and other stakeholders. The goal is to develop the territory and to elicit uh, the needs of, um, uh, sorry, you need, you have 30 seconds, seconds left. Yeah, sure, I will finish soon. Here is one more example. Uh, this is a courtyard uh, created together with the local residents and designers. This is another social cultural initiative in Solnichny, Yekaterinburg, where the local residents offer tours around their neighborhood for anyone willing. So to finish up, This should be researched in sociology, urban studies, and culture studies. Of course, uh, the public spaces are a big part of our lives. 
by solving the local issues of the neighborhood, we will change the city. This is it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this exciting um, presentation. And dear colleagues, feel free to share your questions and notes in the chat or voice it out if you have any. Okay, I guess we're, we're still thinking. Uh, um, my, my question will be the first one, and I, you gave great examples of the public art, but I have a lot of bad examples in my mind. It's good when people unite uh, with designers uh, and produce uh, beautiful things and Rika art uh, that you gave is a bad example maybe uh, where people work uh, solo uh, uh, and remember the firm example where there was a project of uh, the territory branding uh, which was not um, accepted by the inhabitants or remember the Irkutsk brand scandal. Uh, so do you know any examples of the practices where designers managed to, to organize a territory and to work together with the inhabitants? Uh, and do you have any examples or do, do you know how people work in these examples? Yes. Uh, the eight lilies company that I spoke about, uh, and we spoke uh, about it uh, during the international conference on culture. There was a representative of the eight lilies company, uh, and he spoke about uh, satisfying the inhabitants' needs uh, and not only making the territory beautiful, but um, functional and to meeting about he spoke about meeting the needs of the um, local audiences and designers contacted the local community and they they work together even with children and uh, of the inhabitants can use the public space and um, feel um, that they participate uh, and they they feel that the territory is not uh, um, limited by their flat, by the they use uh, inside the of the inside spaces of the building and the um, surrounding areas. But these are very punctual examples. And uh, for now, I see that mostly companies use um, poles. Uh, and other techniques that do not involve uh, local communities, sadly. And I'm doing my master's uh, research on the uh, cultural needs of, on the, of the local communities. And I can see that um, people are not used to express their, their opinions. And it's uh, hard, but still I see that there are people who are willing to communicate uh, and it is important to show them how to to be involved. Uh, there are initiatives, uh, the low, the horizontal initiative, but uh, they should be supported by the government, of course. Well, I hope that the, that we will have more examples of the um, cooperation where we can be proud of uh, our territories and the promote to tourism, etc. I, I think. If there are more questions, uh, you can use the chat. Thank you very much uh, for these precise answers. And I invite Yulia Shulenina uh, from the uh, High School of Economics, Moscow, uh, the Garden City Movement, Kashirska and Shaturska Power Plants. Julia, please. Hi, I'm Yulia Shulenina. Um, a student of the School of Art and Design at the Higher School of Economics. And I chose today the subject that 
is more relevant to the urban design sphere. Can you see my slides? Okay. So the Garden City movement is a continuation of a series of uh, working um, utopian projects uh, following uh, Thomas More, uh, Utopias, and Tommaso Campanella, and all of these uh, utopian cities and garden cities uh, developed in the 19th century followed these conceptions. They were centered in the plan, and you could see these by by the plans of the cities. Uh, one of the uh, examples could be a British uh, um, a city that I will be speaking later. Uh, this uh, project was realized in the early 20th century. The Golden City movement ideas uh, gained popularity everywhere and in Russia, including um, uh, in the late 19th century, the industrial growth was rather prominent. Uh, a lot of questions were uh, being asked about the housing and the conditions of living were analyzed and the garden city conception was offered, uh, combining both the city and the um, the, the rural um, environment. Uh, in the late 19th century, this book was published, as you can see on the screen. Uh, the second half of the 19th century marked the consolidation of the industrial uh, production. Uh, power plants were being constructed uh, in the city, the the types of the uh, fuels were transported, and it was not a very ecological process. And in this context, the idea of the garden city was a um, nice utopia where uh, the the housing was situated inside the city walls uh, and it was projected as a self-sustaining and self-efficient uh, housing unity. Uh, on the plan you can see that the, that the periphery con contains um, uh, industrial uh, sites and in Russia by the 1930 the conception of the Garden City was transformed into a so, uh, social city where the industrial production was placed in the core in the center of the city. Um, so the, we, we see here the uh, reverse tendency, uh, and I will speak about this later. Uh, so we can see a small city of 32,000 uh, people. Uh, one sixth of the territory uh, was dedicated to the urban planning, the rest um, was dedicated to gardens and parks. The city uh, had a circular shape uh, with a park in the center surrounded by housing uh, with a few floors. Uh, so as you can see that the circle is a, the main shape of the city, you can see six uh, boulevards. The very center is a point of interse intersection with public spaces, with um, hospitals, museums, and mayor's houses. Then you can see there's a glass um, gallery surrounding the center of the city with sites for public events. Uh, the, mm, the big city park mm, housed uh, public uh, institutions and uh, gardens. 
and on the external uh, circle uh, of the city, um, industrial sites were situated. Most of the housing was very um, small um, and it did, didn't allow out for upscaling. So the, for the first time, the project uh, in um, Britain was implemented in 1904, it, the city called Lechford and Howard uh, uh, said that it was not successful. The aesthetic uh, aspects were more successful than social and ideological. Uh, most of the housing was uh, was a common property. Yeah, you can see Ledgeford. It was built from 1904, and it w could not be self-sustaining. Um, it depended on London in every way, and uh, with the absence of the industrial infrastructure, the labor market was very poor. Uh, the questions were raised in Soviet Union later on with in the same projects. Mm, lots of difficulties were met and the uh, garden city transformed into the idea of the uh, suburban garden city. And it was uh, realized um, on practice uh, mm, as a suburban areas, uh, garden suburban areas where people uh, sleep live, but they work in the center of the city. In Russia, uh, the book, uh, The Cities of the Future was uh, uh, translated into uh, in 1911, and the conception was highly implemented. Uh, so for Russia, lots of attention was paid uh, to the housing, and it was one of the key social challenges at, of that time, along with sanitary problems. And before the revolution, uh, there was the first garden city, uh, a small town, uh, the Prozorovskaya uh, train station. It was uh, created in 1913. You can see here the plan uh, using the elements of the power of what theory. You see the circle. Uh, plan, the three linear boulevards ascending uh, to the main square with theater, the theater on top. And before the revolution, these ideas were very popular in Russia, and they were used uh, in urban planning of the suburban areas, and uh, they did not uh, have any industrial zones. And it was one of the features of the architectural and urban planning of the of uh, these uh, uh, times. Uh, architects uh, were not allowed to build uh, industrial zones. Uh, and the, the, the first example of the uh, first power plant, which was uh, trans transported uh, beyond the uh, territory of the city, uh, is a, a small town, uh, Electroperedacha. It's a small village, uh, uh, and the, the, it was built in 1914. The, there were quite a lot of villages of uh, this type. Uh, uh, this neighborhood was designed uh, by the authors of the water power plant, and we can see uh, here the lake and the lanes reaching it. Uh, later on, uh, the Soviet politics was aimed at structuring um, these neighborhoods, these towns, and to set up a unified urban policy. The influence of the Garden City was quite huge from the very beginning. 
if we uh, take industrial objects, we will see that they were built uh, following this line. It was this principle was also used in reconstructing big cities, including Moscow, and uh, while building over the suburbia, the revolution gave hopes that the idea of a garden city can be implemented in the Soviet country uh, because the capitalism is rejected, but the harsh reality was different. Uh, the first and foremost pro problem was to solve uh, the issue of not having enough, enough uh, building, not having enough houses, uh, housing for uh, the local residents. In 1920, the plan of uh, building large-scale electric grids all around Russia was adopted, and then uh, the industrial construction started all over the country. The concept of the Garden City was implemented for around 10 years, but then the idea uh, became different. Um, another trend was called the socialist city, where an industrial object was in the center. This is a Shutura settlement. Why did I choose them? Because these are the first power plants constructed following the um, unified plan, and they reflect the dynamics of the evolution of the idea of the garden city. We can see the Shatura project now on the screen. It was designed by the Vesnini brothers. There was a Shatura architect design. And the Shatura experience was, was significant, I believe. We can see that the principles of the garden city are implemented here. This is um, more, uh, more, most of all justified in the uh, decorative elements. Uh, we can see leisure spaces, we can see portals, uh, linear alleys, a lot of plants, and a lot of public spaces too. This settlement was designed for the new state and for the new life in the new state. These tendencies are also visible in the 1920s, although the conditions are very different and the architect's approach is very different. Around this time, the idea of the Garden City uh, was turning into an urban doctrine of development. It was seen as a way of um, improving the urban space, of beautifying the urban space. These are the, the kinds of houses that were built, but I will switch to the next settlement. By 1922, 1921, uh, the state became opposed to the idea of a garden city, and the Kashira project, for example, was uh, rejected because it did not have an industrial center like a power plant. So that was uh, officially stated in the documents, and we can see that although just a few years have passed, there was a turn to the idea of a socialist city already. On the one hand, there was no law that would be normative and that would state that an industrial object should be in the center of a settlement. On the other hand, uh, if the industrial object was not there, then it was criticized. And uh, we can see it in the media, most of all, for example, uh, the architect Reich saw that the new Shatura settlement was a shame and we needed to change the city to make it more relevant. These are the kinds of houses that um, they were planning to build. We can see the dynamics. Uh, 
uh, apartment blocks uh, were the new trend uh, to make the electrification cheaper. It was all made for social, for the socialist production for making it cheaper. The excuse was trying um, to find uh, the cheapest housing possible. This is one of the solutions quite a small one, 36 square meters with uh, two rooms and a kitchen. These are the examples that we can also find in the archives. And in 1923, we can see that the idea was uh, transforming into a socialist city. And uh, to conclude, I will state uh, why this topic is relevant. If we see a garden city just as a suburban or as a rural settlement, this idea is implemented quite broadly now, although it has nothing maybe to do with Howard's initial concept, but including the pandemic condition, our current time, I think that this concept can um, can attract more attention because uh, more attention is in, is introduced. I think that these uh, physical components of the garden city are present in very many cities and towns of our country, and uh, they form a kind of a foundation for possible future urban planning. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Since I love power plant projects, I think it, uh, that your talk was great. Thank you very much. Quite an unexpected topic. Thank you. We have time for questions. You can unmute yourselves if you feel like. Okay, it seems like it's quite hard to gather the thoughts uh, so soon. Um, I will be looking forward to your uh, future talks um, because I think it's a great topic and I didn't know anything about it before. Thank you very much. And it's great that somebody is researching power plants. Thank you. So beautiful. These are words of sincere appreciation from me. Thank you. Okay, we need to switch uh, to uh, the next talk, which will be in English. Marcus, Vinicius, and Anna. Marcus, are you with us? Can you hear the English translation? Okay, so Marcus, Vinicius, and Anna. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, everything is all right. To choose English uh, translation, please click uh, the globe um, icon on the right. The globe icon on the below panel on the right. Just press that icon. Sorry, I need to, I need to find this button. Uh, <laughs> do you see the below panel? Yes. Uh, and the uh, last icon on the right is this globe. Just click it. There is a, for me, there is just a, a red button, leave, just to leave. There is no uh, translation. Oh, on the left, <laughs> just beside uh, the right button. There is no, there, there is no button to mm. translate. Just wait there's second. just the, there is just the uh, the red button to leave mm -hmm. 
Okay, I see. Um, do you use um, this web application, right? But you need uh, you need uh, desktop application. This Understood. Desktop. Yes. Unfortunately, uh, the web version is mm, we don't have this uh, translation stuff. All right. But, uh, for me to present right now, it's okay for you. You can. Or, uh, or connect from a mo mobile. Do you have uh, the Zoom application on a mobile phone? I don't. I, I don't have. I don't have. Uh, for me to 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 present right now, you need uh, you need this uh, for you to understand me, right? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe maybe uh, to don't to don't uh, take a long time. I can I can install and someone else can start the, the presentation. What do you think? Uh, yeah, I think it's possible. So you can join at um, um, in fifteen minutes, maybe. Okay. So are you are you are you leave and install and uh, are you come back? Right. Mm -hmm. So sorry, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> totally. okay. Okay. Are you leave right now and install the desktop application here and come back? Okay. We will wait for you here. In All right. Minutes. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. Извините за заминку, тогда sorry for this pause. So, Alexandra Kolesnik, is, is it okay if you go now? Sorry, Nina, I was distracted uh, because of the counting. If we have to wait for other speakers, so is he going to reconnect? Yeah, this is how I understood it. I mean, I'm ready if you want me to go now. Mm -hmm. So whatever you feel like, whatever the best option. Okay, uh, let's listen to you then now. And when he is back, then we will switch to him. Okay, yeah, sure, not to waste the time. Okay, I, I'm very happy to present to you an Alexandra Kolesnik, EGT uh, High School of Economics, Moscow, who talk is called The Representation of Popular Music and its uh, History in Yekaterinburg, Constructing the Image of the Musical City. Thank you very much. I will share my screen now then. I will try to keep it as short as possible. Because, uh, this is the topic that I research and I have a lot of material for it. To switch to the case as soon as possible, I would just say a couple of words as an introduction. Popular music as a form of cultural legacy and different forms of representation of popular music and its history are uh, researched in Western Europe, in the United States of America, in the UK for the past 30 years. For the past six, seven years, uh, we see more and more works in mo emerging different ways of uh, institutionalization of the past and different ways of representing the past in the city space. So um, it is about different ways of working with the past, working with the memory, uh, mostly this is based on the UK and the USA material. In the framework of the heritage studies and music studies and other areas of research, um, people now engaging more and more in, with music heritage. 
my colleagues and I uh, were thinking of a music geography project, different ways of institutional institutionalizing the music heritage in Russia. This was our reference. Um, in 2019, we organized a tour to Yekaterinburg in the framework of the High School of Economics program Reopening Russia, and it was part of my personal long-term project uh, researching the Yekaterinburg music history, Moscow, St. Petersburg, and we gathered a lot of field data, a lot of field materials. So now I will try to somehow summarize it and uh, put an emphasis on representing the uh, music past and rethinking the music past. In Yekaterinburg, the very idea of uh, seeing Yekaterinburg as a music city, as a city with um, rich music uh, history, uh, we must say that this idea is articulated on different levels um, by uh, festival organizers, curators of music exhibitions, musicians. And it is very interesting, of course, uh, to take a look at what elements go into this image of a music city and how this image is constructed and maintained. If we turn uh, to more details now, if we try to take a look at the forms of working with the music material, the music heritage, we will see that besides very traditional, quite classical forms, different festivals, festivals that commemorate uh, um, uh, different events, uh, anniversary concerts. There are a lot of um, venues also in St. Petersburg. There are events of contemporary music, of classical music. There are a lot of history related locations, quite a lot of sites that are related to the history of music. They're quite democratic in um, in their nature. 2011 um, saw so opening one of these venues uh, from crowdsourcing. 2009, quite an iconic place was inaugurated, a monument to the Beatles. This is uh, turning into a fan memorial, for example, a few years ago when the Linkin Park's uh, vocalist Chester died. Another fan memorial emerged here when Prodigy's soloist died. Um, another um, memory site emerged next to it. We need different forms of institutionalization, articulation of the music heritage. And in Yekaterinburg, uh, this is grassroots initiatives and they are existent. I would like to focus on this. Speaking about the music past and the music heritage of uh, Yekaterinburg, One of the things, uh, one of the main narratives related to the Sverdlovsk Rock Club and Sverdlovsk Rock, which are um, present in the urban space and which are rethought in a very interesting manner. They are reflected, I would say, by the urban spaces. As you probably now, this form of rock clubs emerges in 1980s, and the first rock club was uh, in Leningrad, then the Moscow Rock Laboratory emerged. The Sverdlovsk Rock Club emerged in 1986. It emerged as a form of control on the one hand, institutionalization of rock music in the city, but after 1991, uh, these musicians keep working actively, keep evolving. There is another rock club, Sphinx, 
that the merge, merges, uh, which also organizes the Ural Rock Festival from the beginning of 1990s. In 2019, they emerged uh, the Yekaterinburg Rock Club as a form of self-organization of uh, the local rock musicians, um, not only from the city, but also from the region. It was organized by Vadim Samoylev, uh, one of Agatha Christie members. Now let's try to take a look at different forms of uh, reinforcing the memory about the Sverdlovsk rock in contemporary Yekaterinburg. Apart from the uh, memory sites, uh, the uh, locations that are related to the history of the Ural rock, the uh, museums, memory plaques, I will show it in a while. We can also uh, talk about commemorative practices, commemorative pro processes. There are exhibitions uh, quite recently in 2015, uh, the first exhibition of this kind was held. There are concerts too, apart from anniversary concerts. There are festivals too. Um, they are held either by the members of the Sverdlovsk Rock Club or uh, by the former members of the Sverdlovsk Rock, Rock Club. The composition of the group is changing, but the title is still the same and they keep touring. Some of the musicians are still based in Yekaterinburg. Since 2020, uh, tours are offered uh, based on music and other forms of commemoration are quite actively represented in the urban space. There are also places associated with the history of the Sverdlovs Club, soy uh, underpass, a rock bunker, which is the venue of the Yekaterinburg Rock Club, which keeps a lot of archival materials. There are biographies published, and on the slide you can see three key books about Sverdlovs Krok. Two of them are authored by Dmitry Karasuk, an encyclopedia of the Sverdlovs Krok, and musician Anton Kusimov and Dmitry Melkov, Malachite guitars. These books are sold in the city. And they give rise to um, exhibitions on the same topic. Now let's take a more detailed look at different ways of working with the music past and the representation of the music past in the city space. The first, and maybe um, the most recognizable, is museums. Museums as a way of self-authorization of the music heritage. 2015 um, is the time when the first museum was open on the territory of the culture center Ural Marsh. Uh, it used to be part of the big uh, Ural Marsh uh, factory. Uh, it was a culture center constructed for uh, the workers of the factory. It is a private museum. It was supported by the culture center, of course. The founder of this museum is Vladimir Vidyarnikov, musician of the Sphinx group, which was uh, one of the organizers of the Ural Rock Festival in 2000s. These festivals were annual in 1990s and 2000s. The culture center Ural Marsh is the venue where uh, uh, Vladimir started to collaborate with in 2015. Why did they choose this location? It's not an accident. It was here that in the early 60s, Vladimir Mulavin rehearsed here. Um, you must have heard his name. 
Uh, he was part of Piesneri, a very popular band. Later on, he moved to um, Belarus, but on, it was on the territory of Uramash that he rehearsed, and that's where his music career started. In many museum exhibitions and in the framework of this uh, private uh, museum project, we start to see imagine a narrative of the history of the Sverdlovsk rock, and it becomes a symbolic place for historization and representation of uh, the rock history. These plaques were installed at the entrance to the museum. Uh, this is an underground space in uh, the culture center Ural Marsh, uh, there are plaques in the uh, room which Malavin used to rehearse in. This museum is quite small in 2018, as uh, you may have probably seen on the slide, uh, slide, there was a fire and part of the museum was shut down. Some of the objects were lost, but a lot of things were preserved, fortunately. And in two small rooms, uh, what is exhibited are guitars of the Ural production including Vladimir uh, Vidernikov collection and um, the local guitar master's production. One can also see different objects related to the Ural Rock Festival. This is a kind of a an improvised rehearsal studio space. This is not a real rehearsal studio, but a kind of a recreated mock-up, so to speak. So this is an imitation of uh, how musicians used to record uh, their music at the end of the 80s. Uh, this is rather than the 90s, I would say, because of the equipment, or rather it's eclectic. The exhibition is hard to be called an exhibition. It's quite chaotic and without curator's explanation and the organizer, Vidyardikov, it is quite hard to navigate it. You have two minutes left. Ah, sorry, I lost track of time. I will try to keep it short. Uh, you can see that there are a lot of things related here to the history of sound recording and uh, music production. Uh, memory plaques is another very important thing, and some of them you can see here, including Alexei Balabanov, who showed some of the music videos for the participants of the Sphere Loves Rock Club. Chive members installed a plaque to themselves in a um, on the building where they performed first. By the way, I have to say that uh, there are some conflicts over the memory too, over the past too. There are some unauthorized memory places, including the place of the former Sverlovs Grog Club, which is on the embankment in the very center. The building is closed. A few years ago, it was passed over to the Russian Orthodox Church and besides uh, many suggestions to open a museum to the Sverdlovs Rock Club here or to install monuments around it, the situation is not changing. As I said before, there are a lot of exhibitions going on too, and I will show you that it's not uh, a single exhibition. There are a lot of events in the Ural uh, Federal University, where there's an exhibition devoted to the graduates of the university, uh, the Yeltsin Center, and there were attempts uh, to include the rock music into the geography of uh, the city. Um, also, there was also an idea of renaming uh, the streets, as I said before, and to create a tourist path through the city, a few words uh, on uh, concerts, uh, the framework of the oldest uh, rock festival uh, uh, here in the region, the festival of the old new rock, the organizer Evgeny Gorenburg, uh, his photo you can see on the slide, they offer the, the continuation of the tradition of the Ural rock traditions, uh, and they try to initiate uh, young audiences to these traditions. The festival is 
held annually at the embankment and uh, is associated now with the Yeltsin Center, one of the biggest um, festivals, the Ural Music Night. Uh, there's a tutorial, uh, music school and the music camp where curators uh, are Vadim Samoilov and other participants of the rock club of uh, Yekaterinburg. I will skip another festival and I will skip several slides. Conclusions. I'm out of time, I know. I would like to say that Yekaterinburg uh, is viewed uh, as a historical and musical city with a rich musical history and uh, the circle of agents included in the musical culture is constantly growing bigger. The representatives of the musical uh, community, journalists and fans uh, uh, become an integral part of the memorial processes. Regional projects are being uh, realized in the city. Uh, not all of the projects are connected with the specific Ural history, but are going bigger and larger. Uh, as I mentioned before, the monuments to Beatles uh, or to Michael Jackson. Uh, the history of Ural music is one of the of the key parts of the musical heritage of the city. Um, on the level of the musical community as well as the large administrative uh, level. And, and the ways of memorizing and legitimizing the musical heritage of the city uh, are rather traditional. They do not contradict uh, the actual um, memorial policy of the administration. And, to, to make this memory more participatory is a, quite a, a challenge, I'd say, for the community, because these uh, unauthorized and orthodox forms uh, are not viewed as pertinent by the members of the community. Thank you very much. Thank you for the slides. Uh, uh, Feel free to, to ask questions. Uh, was I too much out of time? No, 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 it's fine. Uh, dear colleagues, feel free to share your questions if you have any. I have a question myself. Uh, I will be the first one to ask. Did you manage to find out how the uh, musicians in the city, the active musicians in the city, uh, are re reacting to this uh, memorial activity. It might be considered as a tourist attraction. Uh, when we speak about uh, the reputation of Vadim Samuel, for example, which is not impeccable, I'd say. Mm, uh, it's quite a challenge. And uh, what about the young generation of musicians uh, who are active now? Uh, did you have the res the, this kind of respondents? Yes, of course. Thanks for the question. We spoke uh, with young musicians as well, uh, with those who are members of the Yekaterinburg Art Music Club, who are the carriers of the tradition of the city. Um, these are young people of 14, 19 uh, years and many of them um, have taken part uh, to into the music uh, music camp or um, the Euro music camp where Vadim Samoylov was the organizer. Uh, but we spoke with other people, uh, with other musicians uh, who play uh, English uh, songs and perform uh, at various different uh, platforms and we were asking them uh, what do they think about this memorization and quite a lot of them rem uh, say that it's quite a good thing uh, it's a part of our history of our heritage but not all of them were saying that that could be the only one 
way of memorizing. Uh, as for the older generation who initiate this kind of memory culture, in spite of all the oppositions and contradictions, and uh, in spite of all the opposition to the um, memorial culture, the official memorial culture, they cannot see uh, any alternative for ways of uh, memorizing. And they want uh, monuments, they want museums, and they want the administration coming to them, suggesting they do something. But the, the administration does not come. And the the tourist potential huge, and Evgeny Greenberg uh, is very active, and he, he's organizing Euro Music Night, uh, and he's a member of uh, the Euro Music Club, uh, and he promotes the idea of of the Yekaterinburg being uh, the musical city for uh, over twenty years now. So yes. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, answer. Uh, I see the question in the chat, but uh, we have to give the floor to our next speaker. So I suggest you uh, shift uh, to the chat. Mm. So Marcus, uh, uh, Marcus Vinicius Santana from Shanghai University and from Federal University of Isos of Brazil. Uh, the space as interface, understanding appropriation of space and the use of ICTs on urban green spaces in Shanghai, China. Marcus, are you ready? Thank you very much. Uh, sorry again by uh, the problem with the translation. Actually, the button was here uh, all the time. Oh. Because I didn't find it, it has a, a, another name on the button. Mm -hmm. It was my, my mistake, sorry. Um, okay. I will try to, uh, to, to share my screen. Mm -hmm. Can you see the, uh, the yeah. screen? I, yes. It's okay? Yes, everything's right. First of all, добрый uh, день. Моя русский нет нет хорошо, очень плохо. Сейчас я поговорю на английский, but I hope that one day I can speak Russian perfectly. Who knows? Well, uh, the name of my uh, of this presentation is the Spaces Interface: Understanding Appropriation of uh, understanding appropriation of uh, uh, space and use of ICTs on urban green space in Shanghai. Uh, it was uh, part of uh, ongoing research and uh, I will present for you some kind of uh, preliminary results. I will try to uh, prepare a very concise, a very, uh, I would say easy to understand presentation. Uh, I will not go deep into uh, uh, theory. Uh, I think it's better to understand. Uh, the topic, the overall topic is uh, ubiquitous, ubiquitous computing, uh, hybrid space and everyday life. This is the field that is the main topics that you uh, uh, make a, a correlation between them. Uh, I don't know if everyone is uh, familiarized with this kind of uh, concepts. By uh, ubicomp, ubiquitous computing, we can understand as a point on history that we can consider that is nowadays when computers start to be in everywhere. Uh, almost every kind of object start to have computer computing capabilities. So we don't have just uh, cell phones, we don't have just uh, personal computers, but we start to have uh, objects that we use in everyday life that they start to have uh, computing capability, capabilities. Uh, for example, you can have, for example, uh, your shoes that can compute information. You can have your fridge that can compute information. 
You can have, for example, uh, a bus stop on the street that can compute information. And when these kind of objects that can compute information, when they start to appear on public space, some authors consider that uh, it rise uh, a new concept, a new kind of space that they call a uh, hybrid space. This hybrid space is uh, a space that uh, is, uh, has characteristics of the, of the space that we knew, but also it can produce data. It can produce data and can do something with this data that is produced in real time. Uh, it's kind of a space that is not just connected to internet, but uh, it's kind of space that is producing data and using this data from their functionality. And everyday life, the, uh, the concept of everyday life is uh, have the, uh, the common sense, but we have uh, people that are studying how everyday life uh, uh, our uh, how we appropriate objects in everyday life since the, the 70s. Uh, the author that I, I work at more is Henri Lefebvre. Uh, it's a French uh, sociology that uh, work with this concept, but uh, in a critical uh, in a critical way. Right now, I will I will not uh, enter exactly on this concept, but. I will just, I want to pass for the problem, what uh, the problem of this, uh, of this research is that after trying to, to understand how many of uh, interactive platforms, I mean, uh, interactive objects that are on this hybrid space, they start to work. I start to understand that many of them, they lack a, a very important uh, uh, point that it lacks engagement. Many people, they don't use. The point is with the development, development of this hybrid space, it starts to appear many, uh, many experiments trying to deploy in this space, some platforms, some interface, some objects that has this capability to interact with the community. And many of them, I cannot say that all, but many of them, they, they lack community. They, uh, uh, sorry, they lack uh, engagement. Some of them, for example, many <coughs> people uh, working with uh, uh, interactive uh, displays, for example, media architecture, not just, uh, not just electronic art, not just uh, uh, big screen walls, but Many people start to don't engage with them. They start to become part of the everyday life. They start to be common. They start to not just to be uh, ubiquitous, but pervasive. People uh, don't see them as kind of uh, novelty. And uh, uh, I start to, we start to think about new ways to use uh, uh, other interface to catch this engagement of people. The objective is to explore and leverage from hyper contextual data to foster this space appropriation. Object of this uh, paper is to, uh, to, to leverage, to take it, to take an advantage, the use that's already happened on this kind of space and try to use this to favor our, our platform. Space appropriation to foster space appropriation. Space appropriation is uh, another uh, core concept here. Uh, by appropriation, we are uh, working with authors that since uh, 1950, they are trying to develop this concept. Uh, by the way, it was one of first that wrote about this. Uh, it was uh, Alexei Leontiev, uh, is a Russian author, and the uh, idea of appropriation, 
here is a space that can be used, a space that can be used to the individ individual to pose himself as, uh, to pose his, uh, 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 his aim and his objectives as leadership in this space to, to make a, a remark of his territory. Some people, they understand that space appropriation is to take the control of a space, uh, uh, breaking kind of laws. In this case here, there is nothing related with this. This is not the meaning that we are, we are working. There is nothing related with uh, uh, taking someone else's space because this, this idea of space appropriation can have a different, uh, different understanding. So in uh, environmental psychology, space appropriation is not exactly this. It's not like to take in control of someone else's space. It's, it's nothing related with uh, broken the laws. It's just idea of uh, uh, to take your, your space and to reaffirm your, your individuality. We use it, uh, a method called behavior mapping and the field experiment to understand how we can leverage, we can uh, leverage and take advance of uses that already happen on some spaces. Behavior mapping is uh, another method that came from environmental psychological and uh, is, is rather old method, is uh, from the 1970s, but uh, is very well used so far. And this method starts to evolve in time. Uh, from that time until now, it starts to use also some uh, electronic device. In my case, I decide to don't use, I start to, 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 to to uh, use the old method with paper and, uh, and pencil. And uh, in the end, I will just uh, show a possible uh, scenarios. I started to develop this, uh, this research in Shanghai, in China, in three main uh, parks, urban parks in the downtown, the very, uh, city center of Shanghai. I don't know if uh, everyone uh, know this city, but uh, uh, here in this, uh, we have the CBD, the core business district, very close to this area. And we have uh, uh, many parks, but three of them are very well known, uh, Shuhui Park, Jinnan Park, and the Renmin Park. They are kind of not just community parks, but they are almost kind of uh, touristic parks, very crowded all day. And uh, I think it's a very good to use this as example to understand how people use ICTs there. Uh, this method, this behavior method is Uh, we need, for example, uh, I don't know if you, you know this method to, to gather information about how people use the space. In this case, we need to uh, divide area in, ma in many sub areas, in many uh, different areas. In each of these parks, Tinan Park, Remin Park, in Suzyahun Park, uh, I divided three main areas. In this case, I was uh, working uh, alone in this in this in these parks. Usually, we use uh, some some team, but here I decided to work alone. And uh, we need to make a very systematic observation of the sites, uh, uh, observing in which place, which user do which activity. And uh, in this case, I observed more than uh, 9,000 points. Each point is one person, can be child, can be adult, can be young, can be female, can be male. Uh, and uh, each of these parts, they are 
have smaller subdivisions that is not on these slides. For example, can be a seat, can be a bench, can be a courtyard, can be a lake, can be a monument. And I was uh, a notation what people were doing in every of these small parts inside every area. I was there doing uh, almost two months in the summer of uh, 2000, 2019. So it was conducted uh, before the pandemics. And uh, uh, it gives me a lot of uh, interesting data. I have uh, a huge uh, table with uh, this data tabulated, but I try to show here just the data collected in one single day. Before, I want to uh, give example of what kind of these uses I was observing. First of all, the, the concept of uh, the concept of appropriation that I am uh, uh, talking about came from, as I told you, from uh, Leontiev, from Bardelawi, Koresek, Sarfati, Enric Paul, Enand and Melis. So during all this time, I think uh, more than a half a century, people are trying to understand this appropriation and evolve, uh, how, uh, understand how the concept evolve in time. By appropriation, we can understand this kind of action. In the first photo, I don't know if everyone can uh, see here. We have a group of people that they are here every day, every single day in the same place, uh, playing music to give animation to the park. Actually, uh, in the beginning, I was thinking that it were common uh, visitors, but they, they were paid by the park administration to be here and to be playing the instruments and to be uh, uh, singing. And they usually gather a lot of people around them. They are a small community there. They are there every, uh, every uh, afternoon after four o'clock until 5.30. The second, in the second uh, photo, we have uh, a visitor take a snapshot from a flower. This, I think, is very, can be something very simple, but is very important for me exactly this kind of, uh, of use, this kind of appropriation. Uh, here, many, you know, on all these, these parks, actually, in all, I, I can say that in almost all Chinese public gardens and parks and even streets, this is a very common behavior how people uh, relate, how people behave with uh, nature. They are always uh, taking pictures, taking selfies and observing and uh, talking with someone else about a flower, about uh, a tree, about uh, uh, a branch, about the green around. Uh, the green spaces there are very, uh, they have a lot of care. There is always a lot of people working around with these spaces. So uh, they have a very close relationship with this, with green nature and with uh, flowers, especially. Okay. The second slide, we have here uh, a couple- Two minutes left. Okay, okay. So you, you be very fast here. We have, we have uh, a group of ladies also taking selfies with the green behind. We have here some families with kids uh, around the lake. And we have here a guy taking picture with a flower again. This is kind of uh, activities that were observed just in one single day. Of course, in walking was the biggest one but uh, sitting also just sitting and doing nothing, but sitting and checking phone, uh, taking shot with phone, uh, making portrait with phone, making um, selfie with phone is less, but we can say that in general, I observed that activities that are done with a cell phone 
And this is the main uh, ICT device that is present on these areas. They are uh, almost 30% of all kinds of appropriations doing in these spaces. We can, we can understand that 28, 30% of appropriations, they are mediated by a cell phone. And uh, doing so, we decided to uh, take advantage of these uses that they already do on space and try to develop uh, an experiment that is a field experiment and you try to develop a platform that can try to uh, take in, in advance these uses that already happen on the space. In this case, we try to develop uh, a platform that also we can say, we can call this an interface that you'll be, uh, this, you, you'll be in the middle of the space and in the user. So we call this an interface that is divided in three models. A model that is more related with IoT, with Internet of Things. A second model that is based on communication uh, uh, or, or, or uh, CUI, communication user interfaces, are interfaces that are based on uh, artificial intelligence, so they can somehow communicate with you. They can take data from the outside and somehow use this data to establish a communication with you. Actually, this technology is very common. All kinds of uh, bots, all kinds all kind of uh, online assistants, they are based on this technology. And there is a, a, a third model is, is based on blockchain that in somehow uh, we want to establish kind of rewards to these users that we use this platform. Uh, right now we have the first model already developed. The second model of uh, the bot, the assistant is uh, almost done. And the third model needs to be developed here, for example, we have an example of the first model. We started to, we start to develop a very early concept, a very uh, early prototype with some sensors, with temperature, humidity, soil moisture. And they, they can take uh, data from these spaces. They can take data from these uh, green areas, for example, and uh, they can send this data for uh, applicant for uh, application from the second model that will use this data to, uh, they will use this data in a conversation, conversation with the user. A user will just uh, scan a QR code on these green areas and they can somehow interact. They can somehow talk, let's say this, with the plant, with the green area, with a tree, even with a bench, a seat. Uh, just to finish, uh, we want to leverage this in kind of a large scale. We can consider a uh, small scale uh, in a scale of home, for example. We can consider kind of uh, mid scale, the scale of uh, uh, greenhouses or uh, community blocks neighborhood blocks, but we want to use uh, this kind of uh, experiment in large scale in big rural communities in, uh, in for hero tourism to develop hero tourism and to heritage tourism. Of course, there is a big gap here from a research that started to understand the behavior of people in urban parks and we want to use these to a completely different setting in a completely different area that are rural parks. And many man, of them even don't have uh, internet access. Uh, but this is the challenge of uh, research. So to uh, summarize, I started here uh, a problem that how, how we can foster, foster user engagement on public open space. Uh, by method, we are using behavior mapping and field experiment. 
I try to time was I, I, I was talking too much and uh, I wanted to talk more about this special interface that I try to summarize here with some photos, the, the three different models. And uh, further discussions are related with uh, new possibilities for this kind of framework and the limitations to use this in kind of large areas. So I think it's like this, it's possible by Shoy. Uh, I'm open for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marcos, for a, for a great presentation.